Welcome, Jim. Uh, thank you. Uh, and what a pleasure to be here. Uh, I gave my very first talk on my very first book in Sid Milkus's class, uh, further, uh, further away. And, I, and I'm a little pissed at the University of Virginia because you've emptied New England of all my favorite people. It's Paul, my former, you know, many years ago, a student of mine, Jen, a colleague. Sid, of course, the bulk work of New England once at Brandeis. Oh, I like that. So I just, I've got a new book. Um, I finished the first draft, the last word of the first draft at 5 a.m. last Monday. Um, so it's completely a jumble in my head, and I'd like you to help me sort it out. But it, there's a draft done now. Um, now comes the, the real intellectual work of making sense of what we have. The question of the book, and this is, I can't keep having a jacket on. You've seen me at my, you know, uh, decent. Um, I'll leave the scarf on. I like this. Okay, I'll leave the scarf on. Um, <laughs> I feel like a priest now. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the question of the book is what, the, we're in this huge partisan era, it seems to get worse and worse all the time, and the question I'm asking is, if we look historically, what's new and what's old about our partisan era today? Mm -hmm. So what I, what I was, and, and some things are obviously not new, um, that if you go back to the first contested election in 1800, there's old Callender, um, James Callender, who, um, who had a journal. That's a, a picture of the journal in the corner. Um, and there he's talking about the president. Uh, you can see, not very nice. Um, and the newspapers were unbelievably partisan um, in terms of violence between the factions. Uh, it was Henry ha uh, James Henry Hammond who said that any congressman who doesn't come to the House of Representatives with a gun in one pocket and a knife in the other comes with two guns. Uh, and we know from other histor historians that uh, there were at least 60 serious uh, brawls on the floor of Congress or, or nearby. So there's some things that people get very excited about today that are actually as old as the Republic. What I am aiming to do here is to, um, is to look at what's new by looking at the past episodes. Now, my original theory was to ask, was to look at a series of elections, but that fell apart after the very first chapter. But here are my cases, and you can just run through them and see. They are, by, by and large, I am varying on the dependent variable, I think. They're, by and large, the great contested moments. Uh, great contested elections, although I tried to go, for example, in 1800 to the point where the contest is over, and actually we have peace after that contest, uh, likewise after 1896, and of course no peace after, say, the election of 1860. So again, the question, what's new about our partisan, uh, about our partisan moment? And I'll just give you a quick peek at the answer, uh, and it's, I think we've taken the great tribal issues immigration in a period of high immigration and race. And it had been that parties diffused those issues for reasons I'll explain. And today, parties, for the first time in American history, amplify them. And that's a, that's a um, development that began to form in the 1930s. So it's been a long time coming. Okay. Uh, oh, and my, what I did, my primary source was the newspapers. So uh, although obviously you read lots of different kinds of things, and I did go to some archives, can't cover archives for all these things, but I used, I followed each election in the newspapers as if I were experiencing that election um, in, in the era. A quick roadmap, what I'm going to talk about, uh, I'll introduce George Washington. I'm going to sneak in a little Hellfire Nation just because I know some of you have done it in class. I'll give you because I think that actually fits t uh, too. Then I'll, I'll, I'll note, you probably all know them, the usual arguments and then my arguments. Um, I want to start with a little wrap on George Washington if I can. Uh, you've all, I don't know if you all know the famous story about the army at Newburgh, New York. You know this? I'll just tell it quickly. Uh, after the war was over, the army gathered in Newburgh, New York. Um, and waited for the peace treaty. So you don't want to disband the army, which is so hard to keep together through the war, until the peace treaty is actually signed and you're sure it's all over. 
and the army was on the brink of rebellion. They were furious, and they were furious because they hadn't been paid. Uh, many of them were looking, some of the officers were looking at debtor's prison when they got out of the army. Now, they'd been offered half pensions for life. It wasn't much fun being in this army for eight years, so they, they'd been paid for it, or they'd been promised pay. They weren't getting the payment. The reason was obvious. Uh, Continental Congress just didn't have the money. Um, and the soldiers decided that they, were, they began to foment a rebellion. The idea was they would keep the army intact and use it to leverage uh, benefits and maybe even take over the country. There's a lot of talk. And behind the scenes, Hamilton is egging them on because he thinks if he foments a crisis, maybe he can get some uh, Continental Congress to actually get some tax money. So it's, it's all lots of intrigue. They're going to have a big meeting at the Temple of Virtue, so-called, because that's where religious services were held, and plot, they do their plotting. Washington gets a hold of the, of, of the plans, and it's all in Washington's letter. There's a wonderful description of this event as Washington perceived it. Others wrote letters, too, though not Hamilton, as far as I could find out. Washington appears before them, and in a famous George Washington story, he, um, he gives the speech, it's, it's, it's in the New York Public Library, a uh, beautiful speech, begging them not to rebel, not to drown our uh, empire of liberty and blood before it's even formed. And they are, by his own account, unmoved. Uh, they're pissed. And then, we don't know if this is stagecraft or not, but he pulls out a letter, you know, he pulls out a letter and begins to read it from a congressman in Pennsylvania, promising that he will try to get the money. And he pulls out of his tunic a pair of glasses, puts them on. And at that moment, they suddenly see that Washington, this strapping, strong soldier, is getting old. And, um, and he says, you must forgive me, gentlemen. I've grown not only gray in your service, but I find myself going blind. And from their letters home, we know some of the soldiers began to weep, these tough guys. It's the end of the rebellion. Now, the important thing about the story is what do we make of it? And I want to tell you quick, three quick stories. The usual story, the fili filio pietistic story, if you will, the Washington conclusion, and the conclusion I want us to draw. So the, the usual story, um, do I have it here? Yeah, there's the usual story. Um, who was saying that PowerPoint should be all pictures if, if you're a historian? <laughs> um, Washington walked away from power. Real leaders do not clutch powder in a republic power. Power. In a republic, you walk away. And Washington did it for the Continental Army. And secondly, he did it from the presidency. When he did it a second time, George, uh, George III says to Benjamin West, if he does this, if he gives up power, he truly is the greatest man in the world. But he does. And so he sets the motif for Republican leadership. Second story is Washington's own story. We almost lost the republic, he says. He, uh, because the government wasn't strong enough. And he writes a series of circulars, letters. His uh, cir circular giving up power to the states says that he hopes the citizens of America would strengthen the hand of government, be happy under its protection. He is sure they'll be happy to pay taxes to make the government stronger. He ends with this, um, and you can read it for yourself, but cultivate a spirit of subordination to government. If Bernie said that, he would be pilloried. No politician today could say something about government as strong as this. Um, so Washington's take home, we have to have a strong government, or we won't be able to have an army, we won't be able to have a true republic. Um, there's a third take home, and that squares the circle between walking away from power and um, and, and, and having a strong government. And that's, you, you, you reject partisanship. You do the right thing. Um, and this is the, the beginning of my text. Um, every one of the founders are on record as saying, and they believed that one of the few things they agreed on is that partisanship is corrosive. And if we're going to have a republic, we can't have partisanship. And there's the, uh, a series of quotes. Ben Franklin of the Constitutional Convention famously suggests, let's not pay our public servants. Because if we pay them, uh, there'll be parties. And if there's parties, then it's all going to go to hell. Um, so, uh, and of course, uh, Jefferson, always the best quote. Um, about, uh, against parties. The problem with this is the founders who left us something to glom onto, left us some guidance, 
in almost everything left us no guidance on partisanship. Who votes? How do they vote? How do we run our partisan world? They weren't interested in that because they didn't believe in it. So take the most basic matter, who votes? For the president, well, we know they've got these electors. Well, who chooses the electors? Silence. The president, the, the states choose the electors. And um, uh, so you just leave it to the states. Uh, yeah, let's take a couple of other examples. Uh, we never fix this problem. Um, 17th Amendment, you were told that the 17th Amendment has direct election of senators. Not so. What the 17th Amendment says is the states will tell you who can elect senators. If you're an African American in the South, the state says no, because you're not voting for the, uh, for the legislature. If you're a woman in um, Utah, yes, you may vote for a senator, but not in New York, at least till uh, 1918. So the states, once again, are deciding. And one of the great surprises for me, same thing with the former slaves, by the way, in the 15th Amendment. They left, they, they left a honking loophole in there. Um, I'll say, I'll say that for a, a minute. Um, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. They had a much stronger amendment in one of the chambers, but the uh, New Englanders did not want a stronger amendment because they wanted to slap a literacy test on the Irish and keep them from voting. And the Californians were worried about the Chinese, so nativist sentiment kept the 15th Amendment from being as, as strong as it, the original version would have had it. So what is it? Okay, you can't deny on the basis of race, but you can deny on other bases. And we are denying other, other bases. Big debate in Congress, not a big debate, small debate in Congress about this, but the clear majority said, no, we want to be able to deny the vote. Um, here's the basic punchline. The founders never told us about voting. They left it to the states. And what's a, this thing that's se my second biggest surprise as I did this study was the extent to which it was a political football right from the very start. Um, no partisanship, do the right thing, big silence in what that is, punt it to the states, and the states do whatever is in the best interest of the majority. I have more to say about this in a minute. But it's a political football as soon as we start contesting elections. That is in 1800, and shockingly so. So that's the most striking thing, and that kind of sets up the whole conversation. We see throughout two debates, the partisan debate, whatever we're arguing about at that moment, and the debate about how we're going to actually count votes cast and count votes. And those go parallel through American history. I'm quite surprised. I don't know, maybe you guys are all already know this, in which case part of my book will be dull. But that's the sort of foundational story. I, um, so those are the three take-homes. Walk away from power. We need strong government. Uh, really, let's not have partisanship. So we don't set up for uh, partisanship. I want to uh, take a quick sidebar, just for seven minutes, and remind you, because I know you've been force-fed this book, uh, what Hellfire Nation says, <laughs> only because it actually makes a competing claim about partisanship. Uh, I like to think they're parallel, not contradictory, <laughs> but I could imagine someone say, no, your new book is full of beans, and someone else wrote the book that explains all this. <laughs> so let me just get it out quickly, and then we can, we can discuss it in, uh, in a minute. So here's the Hellfire story. Again, there's the Arbella, named, by the way, for those of you who've read Louis Hartz, by the woman who put up the money, Lady Arbella. So you could find a Hartzian story here, but let's not get into that. Um, the Puritans arrive in New England, and as I tell the story, the great sort of metaphor for the whole business is they face a problem, the pop, their existential problem. Who are we, they have to ask. Who is a proper Puritan? In England, it was easy, uh, and in Holland, because you're persecuted, so you, uh, you, you, you could identify yourselves by your persecution. But um, here, in the new, uh, here in the New World, there were, as one of their ministers put it in 1636, uh, a guy named Shepherd. here there are no enemies to drive you to heaven. So what will, how do we identify ourselves? They came up, I argue in the book, a doozy of an explanation, and that is we are the, we are the community of saints. We are the, the people preordained in their neo-Calvinist universe. Uh, and I know it's not entirely neo-Calvinist, but put that aside for a minute. Um, the, the, the people who lead the community are the people who have gone through the ritual that proves, insofar as mortal man can tell, 
who's been predestined for salvation? The community of saints. If you're predestined for salvation, as far as we can tell, you can take communion, you can vote a very wide franchise uh, among the saved, of course, um, and you have all the rights of citizenship. If you were not so sure, you haven't gone through the ritual, we're not quite sure, you're, you're, you, you can't vote, but you're expected to follow the saved. A community of saints. And of course, there's inevitably a group of people who we're pretty sure are not saved, are damned, and they have to be driven off. You can't have them in your community. Uh, driven, uh, burnt as witches, uh, killed as Native Americans for consorting with Satan, or driven to Rhode Island for heretics. The Latrina of New England as uh, Cotton Mather put it, for all the noxious heresies that flourish there. I often point this out to my colleagues in faculty meetings that it's the latrina of New England. They never laugh. Um, <laughs> but notice, notice what's going on in the society. We have a society where moral standing um, identifies us, identifies privilege, identifies the community, and identifies the other. It's moral standing that does it. and. Um, uh, there's uh, images of the other. There's poor Giles Corey being, uh, having rocks put on him so he uh, says exactly uh, how his witchcraft uh, uh, got Satan there on the lower left-hand corner. Two final dynamite twists turn this story into uh, more intensity. So we have a moral uh, community. And the first is the famous John Winthrop sermon about which there's a lot of new uh, scholarship, but let's just take it on its face. Uh, the eyes of all people upon us. Well, if you put eyes of all people upon you, your moral behavior is a public issue. It's not just a private matter. We, 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 our whole community is at stake. What happens to our whole community is at stake. And secondly, it was an immigrant nation right from the start, so we might have it right, but Irish Catholics or former slaves or Jews or... Um, Latinos or Asians or Chinese or Muslims. Every generation has a community coming over. Every generation has a culture war because of this combination of self-definition and ideal in this society. And I argue in this book that it touches every public policy that we have, this notion of us and them defined by a moral line. Um, I tell my undergraduates a story to pull this all together. We have time for just one story, so I'll, I'll give it to you. Um, when the Clinton health plan came out, uh, Senator John Chafee, pictured there, a lovely man, uh, decided it would be a good idea to have a series of debates around Rhode Island. I was to take the Clinton side, and he was to suggest a much less um, ambitious alternative that involved uh, mandating that people buy health insurance and pay for it on an open market. That plan would have later a later life, but at the time it was the conservative plan uh, as opposed to the Clinton plan. And um, in the first debate at Rhode Island College, uh, I, I, originally I was killing him. I was just running right over him, not because of my debating prowess, but because the whole audience was very liberal. The students were sure that they needed Clinton plan and they would sigh and roll their eyes whenever Chapin talked, but my ace on the hole was a, um, was a guy who was the head of the Great Panthers, great shock of gray hair, standing in the back. He didn't realize he was hard of hearing. So every time uh, Mr. Chafee talked, he would turn to the fellow next to him, this Great Panther in the back, and he would say, and I'm quoting exactly, he would say, that's bullshit! <laughs> and he'd say it that tone of voice and that loud. So um, Chafee was having a hard time. <laughs> And then he gets, I could see he was getting more and more annoyed. And finally he turned to me, it was about four minutes to go. And he turns to me and he says, Professor, this isn't going to work. Sad shake of his head. When they call you Professor, you're in trouble, right? <laughs> it was Jim to Len. He said, how are you going to ask the hardworking people in Cook County to go into the same insurance pool as the crackheads in the city of Chicago? That's just not going to work. And I turned to my, my people uh, with this, to blow away this fatuous dichotomy, and they're all, oh, totally, totally upset. And unfortunately, I said, well, they're not all crackheads in the city of Chicago, hardworking single moms. He goes, oh, yeah, 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 promiscuity and single moms is another thing we have to worry about. He's a 1990s Republican. After the debate, all anybody wanted to talk about was, yeah, what's Clinton going to do about crackheads? 
So what Chafee had done is he had said, you liberals all think that you're in the same problem together, but you're not. There's a hardworking us, and let me just flip it and show you that there's a racialized other in this debate, and I can make you nervous about them with just a simple phrase. And it's not that you don't like people of color, it's that you're worried about immorality. And those immoral people don't deserve what hardworking people deserve. Which is to say, all universal programs, all programs come down to this old trope that have found in the Puritans and spread to the rest of America. And I think it's got an intensity and a permanence and a, uh, a life that goes on. So that when we hear a, a, a politician talking today, uh, Donald Trump, for the lack of a better example, um, are there any other examples in our, in our heads right now? Um, when you hear a Donald Trump talk, you can hear this chafy, this chafy line. So that's an alternative explanation, or better yet, a complementary explanation. But let's get back to our divided nation today and see what I think is different. So you know, you know, the United States is divided right down the middle. When I give public talks, I make a big deal about, you know, there you are in Texas, no blue. You got to drive 500 miles to get to blue. Um, and parties, if, you, uh, if you've done any American politics at all, you're familiar with this chart from the Pew uh, Foundation. Um, look how parties have just gotten such powerful predictors of our values, more than race, more than gender, more than class, more than education. If you tell me what party you're in, I can guess more accurately about your values than anything else you can tell me. Um, moreover, the two sides um, have gotten to be very disparaging of one another. Here's a survey I really like in which people simply ask, um, what do you think of the other party? As you can see, Republicans think Democrats are closed-minded and, uh, um, and immoral. Right, of course. <laughs> right. Uh, Democrats think, uh, well, you could see it there for yourselves. Um, they don't trust one another. In, um, in 1960, they did a survey, and 5% of the Democrats would be very upset if their child married a Republican. Today, it's moving up towards 50%. One out of two people, not quite, but almost, uh, believe it would be a real problem, both parties, so that we've got an intensity, not just in the political elite, as far as I could tell, and I got this from Jen Lawless back when she was at Brown, as far as I could tell, it goes really quite deep into the party bases. It's like the old Italian joke. Um, the little girl comes home and says, Mommy, Mommy, I want to be a prostitute when I grow up. And the mother goes, What? And they go, I want to be a prostitute when I grow up. And oh, thank God. I thought you said a Protestant. <laughs> well, just substitute Democrat. It's the same thing. Um, so why are we so partisan? Sorry. The usual, <laughs> the usual story is very close elections. That's the, yeah. Um, uh, there's the five. There's, you, uh, if you've done any American politics, you're, you're familiar with them. I'll just say about close elections, it is striking. We have flipped a, si a chamber in Congress seven times in the last 12 years. And we just, in the last election, uh, overcame the 1876 to, uh, 18, uh, 17, uh, sorry, 1876 to 1878 period when it was six flips. But for a 12-year period, we've broken the record. That is to say we've never had a period where competition, party competition, has been this tight, this close. Um, there's a couple periods that are close, but we are surpassing them. No point working with the other side. If you are in Congress, both sides, so if you talk, if you interview Congress, people will all agree with this. If you're a Democrat and the Republicans control the chamber, sure, you can appeal, you can try to work with them, but better to tie them up in knots and try to take the chamber back the next time. And it's working. Chamber's just flipping back, likewise the presidency. Um, eventually in the past, sometimes very quickly, Jefferson election, uh, after 1800, New England just pouts. Their newspaper articles are full of stuff. I'll tell you about in a minute. But it's over. It's it. Uh, we got a majority. We got a minority. We've got um, we've got uh, the the tough party competition is over. And there's other cases like that. Eventually, a majority wins. If one party takes over, you'll see all this stuff go away. But as long as it's this close, Francis Lee made this argument famously for Congress. Then another another of a, a series of arguments. Um, in uh, 1950, the political scientists came out with a report and said, why don't the parties all 
why don't they why don't they reflect different ideologies well it's actually a good report if you read it it's much more sensible than it now sounds but we got what they half of what they asked for they also asked us to clean up our voting system which might have made things different democratic liberals all in the democratic party republicans uh, conservatives all in the republican party that's new um, never been like that um, Likewise, Gingrich came to town, and boy, the rules he put in place. He saw the Republicans were comfortable in the minority, and he insisted. I had lunch with um, a Republican congressman, Ron Maiklin, and he was quitting. I, I asked him why he was quitting, for a number of reasons, but the most important was he played basketball. He was lonely in Washington, and he played basketball with a bunch of guys three times a week, and Gingrich came to him and said, you're playing basketball with Democrats. They are the enemy. Get used to it. No more basketball. And so you, you're not allowed to be with the other side. Gingrich rules. Um, and now we've got the Gingrich senators who are uh, putting those rules in the Senate. And of course, uh, hyperpartisan media. I didn't mention the government of strangers. Uh, Daschle is writing thing after thing on this. Um, 110 congressmen now have cots in their offices. They refuse to have a, 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 a flat in Washington. They don't want to be tarred with the Washington. They fly in Tuesday do their business and fly out Thursday. Again, unprecedented, no institutional uh, connection with one another at all. So there's the five classic reasons. Political scientists have done beautiful work on this really interesting work. But I want to add something else that comes out of the history. Um, and I think I call it the elephant in the room for the obvious reasons. And I think the easiest way to present it, I've just finished, so it's all buzzing in my head, but uh, I think the easiest way presented is just to go right back to the 1800 election because that sets the pattern. Sets the pattern. I'm glad I'm with so many eminent historians and people who at least appreciate history uh, because going back to 1800, after all, we all know that the election of 1800 was about the role of government. Uh, George Washington was articulating the Federalist position at the beginning of my lecture. Um, Adams, now in the first contested elections, the first time people are actually running out front, not the candidates, but the people around them. Um, and Adams, strong active government, Jefferson and the Republicans, uh, absolutely opposed to that. The states are closer to the people they ought to rule, a sort of neo-anti-federalist argument, fine. The second most inf uh, th important thing in this debate are the alien and sedition laws, which, uh, which the Adamsites pass in 1798, and the Alien Acts in particular. Um, the Federalists were terrified of the refugees that were coming over. They didn't sound quite like Donald Trump, but they really thought they brought the raucousness of the French Revolution to America. That is, that America was at risk from these people. And so we had to be able to deport them. First, shut them up in their newspapers, because their newspapers were very rowdy. And second, deport them at, at, a, at a moment's notice. Um, if they get if they get rowdy, um, I I want to see. Meanwhile, the Democrats are signing them up. These are natural Democrats. I'm calling them Democrats and Republicans. They call themselves Republicans, and historians to clean it up and make it easier call them Democratic Republicans. Um, but th they never use that term. They call themselves Republicans. But the P Jefferson Party, later the Democrats would always be the party of immigration. They were fine with signing people up when they were still seasick um, and having them vote. And that's true right from the start. So you have two parties, one of which really fears the immigrants as a threat to America, the conservative party, the Federalists in 1800, the Whigs will take this position a whole cloth, the conservative party, and then the Republicans will be the party of nativism right through uh, the 19th century. The Democrats always embrace the Democratic Party, um, and they knock the Alien and Sedition Acts in their, uh, in their uh, campaign platforms right through the 1860s, that we will fight the spirit of the Alien and Sedition Acts, which still abides in the uh, opposing party. The Federalists are dead and buried by 1860, but we're still arguing the Alien and Sedition Acts. There's a third story. Big government, immigrants. Uh, and beautifully divide the two parties. There's a third story that gets lost, but if you were to go back and read the papers the month before the election, this is the story that will get most of the press. The Alien Acts, after all, are two years old. We know about that. It's the racial story. Adams gets all the bad press and is always on the list of worst presidents because of the Alien Acts. But if you were to just the civil rights story, 
Adams would be one of the more enlightened presidents. He makes, in 1791, there's the Great Re uh, Rebellion, the Slave Rebellion, in Saint Domingue, um, and in, sorry, yeah, there it is, and uh, it terrifies the Jeffersonian party because here are slaves who have killed their masters, fought the English for four years, the English took heavier losses in Saint Domingue, given that it was only four years, than they took in the American Revolution, so incredibly bloody, and then they fight the French, who also take enormous losses. The French decide we can just commit a genocide and then repopulate with slaves. So here are these, this horrific situation, and Adams decides, he always wants to stick it to the French, that he is gonna ally with Toussaint Louverture, the head of the slave rebellion, and indeed sends three ships over to help him out. The first time the American Navy bombards uh, a rival in, this, in a, civil, a, a civil war abroad is in the Haitian rebellion. They create a treaty known as Toussaint's Clause in which the Adams administration makes a trade treaty uh, with the re re slave rebels. The Jeffersonians go crazy. They, Jefferson himself writes that what will happen if ships from this uh, country come full of former slave sailors who come aboard ashore and tell people in the American ports that, oh, we were slaves, but we rebelled, we killed our masters. The Federals have no problem with this. This becomes particular. That's 1791, it happened a while ago, but the month before the election, Gabriel rebels in, in, in Virginia. Biggest slave rebellion to date. It's caught, 24 people executed, and the newspapers are full of this rebellion. And the Jeffersonians blame Adams. And what they say over and over again is, you send golden carriages to Toussaint, our slaves see that, and what can they think? They do the same thing that Toussaint gets, and they are hung. You're sending a mixed message. The new, some of the New England press begins to say, yes, the problem is slavery itself. I was amazed to see this in 1800, far uh, sooner than we expect the abolitionist argument. It's not an argument among popu uh, 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 politicians. It is an argument among populations already. So notice what we have. One party, the conservative party, it hates immigrants, but is very enlightened about race and is for big government. They want to dig canals, et cetera, et cetera. You saw the George Washington quotes. The other party is embracing immigrants, hates big government, and is fearful of, let's call them racial conservatives, to use neutral language. But they're fearful. They don't want to mess around these relations. What I argue is that in all my cases, this is the lineup. The more conservative party is the party of government till the 1930s, is the party of, immigra uh, of um, nativism, and is the party of um, more liberal racial policies. While the more liberal party wants local government, very generous on immigration, and, um, and quite repressive on slavery, or let's just say, want to keep the current uh, strictures in place. That is the pattern, and that's the pattern that is broken in our current times. I won't talk much longer, but there's one other thing I have to tell you about in the election of 1800. There were 17 states in that election. Seven changed the way they're going to elect the president. During the election campaign, seven of 17. Uh, Virginia, don't be smirking here, you Virginians. Uh, in Virginia, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they decide, wait, Adams is going to get one of, our, um, one of our electors if we go by district. Jefferson has always been for election by district. He changes his mind now because he wants all, uh, all the electors. Uh, it, it turned out not to be the crucial, um, not to be the crucial vote. Uh, there's what I, I just said. I forgot. Um, sorry, I added an elitist. Uh, I'm not talking about that, so forget what's in brackets. Um, So, so in each case, uh, over and over again, we have this fiddle around, um, around, uh, around the election. All right. Um, oh, here's just an illustration of the difference. This is a racist cartoon 
uh, in Harper's Weekly during the um, uh, post-war period. And it just illustrates we each have our own liminal group. You Republicans have African Americans. We Democrats have um, the equally liminal uh, Irish. Um, let me say, so, okay. So how are politics turned tribal? Let me get to what changed. So we have this lineup, and notice what this lineup means. What it means is the parties diffuse uh, tribal tensions. In fact, mass parties in 1840 are actually organized to deflect the slavery issue. But since either parties or party factions each hold a different liminal group, you want to, the question, who are we, that old Puritan question, that isn't answered by party politics. Insofar as party politics is crucial, it diffuses, um, it diffuses the uh, tensions. You know, let me back up and make one more point, if you can, if you can tolerate just a, there's one point I went over lightly, but let me make it a little bit more strongly. So I said there were three things in play, immigration, race, and belief in strong government. This was the, th there's a thing that surprised me most, and I, I, I think I should say a word about it, because it's the, it's the, uh, it's the most difficult thing I've come across, and I'd like your feedback on it. Um, the thing that most surprised me was the extent to which the anti-government impulse, the dread of government, to coin a phrase, was tied up in the fear of race. So the party that resisted the government was always the party of white supremacy, to just put it baldly. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Of course, you just worked through an example after example, but I was struck by this. It's true in 1800, as I just suggested. By the 1840s, John Quincy Adams, an irascible congressman now, ex-president, writes again and again to his colleagues that slavery is palsying the hand of the nation because we can't get anything through Congress because the slaveholders block all strong government action. They think if you can do this, um, you can then free the slaves. Just, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples to give you a feel for this. In the Confederacy, if you read the f Confederate Constitution, it goes word by word for the federal Constitution, except, of course, it puts slavery in there, front and center. But it does something else. It says, when you, uh, in the enumerated powers, it says absolutely no using <coughs> interstate commerce to increase the power of the federal government. They're very clear that they want a highly limited national government. William Jennings Bryant, in the next uh, case, you resist needful government action, he argues during his incredible <coughs> election campaign to the Southern Democrats, because you're afraid your Jim Crow laws <coughs> against the Negroes will be abolished by the general government as if your personal objection to riding with Negroes should interfere with a great national reform. What I found over and over again is two strains that have been interlinked I wrote a whole book on this and missed, missed the point, but um, the, the fear of government is all mixed up with racial fears. I've never seen the extent to which, uh, to which that, that is, the two are linked. Goldwater comes along in 1964 and really illustrates this. Here is a man who, in so far as you could say this about anyone, really had no racial prejudice. He was genuinely open-minded. In various stories that tell this. Even Martin Luther King said he admired his racial views. But he's elected in 1964, and you read the 1964 campaign, and it is a festival of segregation. The uh, African Americans who are at the, um, at the 1964 uh, uh, Republican convention write harrowing stories in the front pages of the black press. Jackie Robinson uh, talked about feeling like he was in Nazi Germany. Um, and another, uh, another a black reporter, black Belva Davis, talked about uh, bottles being thrown at her as she tried to escape with people yelling the N-word at her. That this was, that here is Goldwater, this sincere conservative, but he says nothing as the segregationists climb on board. This is the, this is kind of the difficult story. I'm not suggesting the two are the same, I'm suggesting that the story of anti-governmentalism has gotten its political juice from racial fear. 
uh, in case after case, and I realize this is going to make this book quite unpopular in some circles. So let's just talk about how we get to here today, and let me then turn to you guys for advice, questions, brickbats, whatever. The traditional, ah, wow, we're back at the Federalists. Okay, well, there you can see the, um, there you can see the summary yet again. <clears throat> The Republicans, the African Americans, so it begins with African Americans switching parties. African Americans are Republicans, they always vote Republican. Um, uh, a very strong vote, but in 1908, this is Taft's inaugural address, you can read it, uh, the Republicans basically wash their hands of the African Americans, but they still get the vote. Um, in 1932, African Americans begin to switch. The Pittsburgh Courier, the black one of the great black newspapers, actually endorses Roosevelt. And they say, we know it's a segregationist party, but we just have gotten nothing from the Republicans. The Chicago Defender responds and says, no, you can't. You can't do that, the, other, the black newspaper in Chicago. Uh, but we're very unhappy with the uh, Republicans. In 1936, Republicans begin to move. Uh, I'm sorry, African Americans begin to move into the Democratic Party. Um, now, this is a story, partially because of the benefits of the New Deal, partially because of local democratic organizations in the cities who are pushing, who are recruiting African Americans who've come north and who now vote, are recruiting them into their parties and are creating a crisis in the National Democratic Party because all of a sudden there are these African Americans and liberals who want to change the segregationist party policies. And so what you have is a battle in the Democratic Party that lasts between 1936 and 1964. This, uh, in 1936, for the first time, uh, the, uh, a black Democrat gets sent to Congress. Before that, it was all black Republicans. Um, this goes against the great book written by Ira Katz Nelson, which you've probably seen. Ira's brilliant book iconic book, says the Democratic Party was a party of Sweden and um, South Africa, and that everything went through this filter. And you people who uh, uh, idolize the Democratic Party, Sid, uh, uh, idolize the New Deal, are really just wrong because it's really a racist period. It's probably putting it a little strongly, but not very. At a minimum, it's a party divided between two impulses. In the longer view, I would qualify that. And I'd say what has happened is we have a pure segregationist party that beginning in 1936, because of what's happening at the local level, not the national level, begins to bring African Americans in and sees a battle for the African American vote. Moderate Republicans in the Northeast realize this is a life, uh, a life and death conflict for them too. The John Deweys of the world know that if they lose the black vote, they're over. And so you have this huge battle in the Northeast. And here's the African-American vote. Before 1936, it's all red. This is like party identification, not vote, I'm sorry. Uh, reconstructed recently by political scientists. Um, and notice how 1936, for the first time, more African-Americans identify as Democrats than as Republicans. But then it's even to 1940. 44, there's a big division, and 48, when the Dixiecrats bolt, is when the, 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 the huge break gets made. So the same period Ira covers is the period in which we sort out, and all of a sudden, for the first time, the Democrats own African-American vote. And you can see 1964, I won't go into why, but after 1964, that battle is over. Results. Democrats now are the party of African Americans, and moderate Republicans in the Northeast are dead in the water. Some of them hang on, but it is a dead party. And they knew this was coming, and it's in the newspapers, and everybody says the, John, the, the Thomas Deweys in the world cannot survive if they lose the Democratic vote. After 48, it's pretty clear that that's all over for them. Um, so, I, the... Yeah, let me add let me add the immigrants. In nineteen sixty-four, uh, Johnson very casually pushes through. 
uh, Hart Cellars, and the immigrant gates, which had been closed in 1924, no immigrants at all. When Woodrow Wilson took the oath of office that year, 1.2 million immigrants came ashore. When Franklin Roosevelt took the oath of office, 32,000 came ashore. So that's the difference. So that, that gets off the books. Now it's back on the books as a racial matter. Hubert Humphrey, who sees it through in Congress, says we want to align immigration law with civil rights law. If it flush with the success of civil rights, we are going to make remake. Uh, we're going to reopen the gates because that's what a proper uh, civil rights policy requires. Note what's happened. One party for the first time, starting in 1964, has both the African-American vote and is embracing immigrants. And oh, by the way, it's the party of big government. And so for the first time in American history, we have a party of big government, a party of immigration, and a party of race, as opposed to a party where you could call it the party of no, no, and hell no, or you could call it a party of people who consider themselves white nativists, people who consider themselves white, and people who are very suspicious of the federal government. There's the white vote for the Democrats after 1972, it's gone. Uh, Jimmy Carter almost gets 50%. Uh, we're still not quite sure of 2016. Jen, what is it, 39 or 33% that Hillary got? There's a big debate right. So of the white vote. Yeah, so it's probably closer to the high end. High, higher end. But still, you can see white people stop voting in presidential elections. There's much more to say about this, but let me just put it, uh, put it in that narrow way. And here's what it looks like today. The class of 2018, there's the Republicans, and thank God for Carol Miller or it's white males all the way down. <coughs> and look at that Democratic Party. They got, they got 12 white males and they don't have anything against them, but what a difference. You want partisanship, there it is. They're different tribes. Um, I did not tell the gender story, partially because I was intimidated by Jen being here, but partially because there's, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a much more messy story, but there is a gender story running through this now. And right on cue, majority-minority nation. Now, those demographic projections are highly disputed, but they've gotten out. So not only do you have a party of people of color and all those other tribes and white people, but in the context where the Census Bureau is saying by the year 2060, white people are going to be 43%. So that we have at this very moment enormous pressure on what whiteness itself is. So here is the perfect storm for real tribal conflict. So uh, uh, aside from all those other things I talked about, like really close elections and so forth, I think what gives this intensity, what gives our tribal moment its great intensity is that it's a racialist moment. And we have not been set up for that. We don't have a tradition of the parties sorting themselves out on this tribal line. They've always deflected that, as I've been saying through the talk. And, um, and now they are not just not deflecting it, they're mainlining it right into Congress. I mean, you can see this, and right into the presidency, you can see this happening. Those two tribes are going to feel different, not just because they have policy differences, because they are different people. Uh, now, I know there's people in the middle and so forth, but I think this racial thing is very powerful, and we're, we're not giving it enough due. So here, I think, are the great differences. There's a racial sort, there's a demographic sort. There's a gender gap, I haven't talked about that, but boy, it's gotten big with Trump. Um, and um, do we end at 11.30 or 12? 12. Ah, give me another three minutes. <laughs> so there's one other thing I, I need to talk about. This makes Trump look a little better. Here is, it's inequality, so I'm gonna turn the page. This is not my story, but I think it, um, it intensifies my story. Um, I mean, I, I try to trace this through the book, but lots of people have written about this. Here is the Gini Index. So zero is complete equality, 100 is Sid has all the money, uh, no, uh, everyone else is none. 
Um, it's actually one, to, it's one, zero, one. I multiplied by 100 to make it easier. Look at the United States. It's ahead of those socialists in France, a little behind Japan, but it is in the European League, uh, about 10% behind uh, Germany and Denmark, and 15%. Uh, so it's a, it's a European, it's a laggard in the European League uh, in 1970. Um, I'll come back to this. Um, and then if you look at the latest set of numbers put together by the CIA, the United States has, uh, that was 1970, uh, the 1970 column is to your left, and, uh, and you can see the second column uh, is the, the, the latest uh, international statistics. Look how the Europeans have basically kept, some have even become more egalitarian, despite all the angst there, because there's a lot of pressure on their policies, but not the United States. The United States has become enormously inegalitarian. Indeed, you would no longer talk. It used to be that the idea of comparing the United States to Brazil was silly or Mexico. Now, you would, we're playing in the Latin American leagues, not in the European leagues. Indeed, we are closer to Lesotho the least egalitarian country on record than we are to Sweden, the most egalitarian country on record. Now, you're perfectly right to challenge the data from Lesotho, but nevertheless, uh, I think the data from Brazil and Mexico is probably pretty firm. Um, and we've become, and certainly the data from the United States is pretty firm. Likewise, social mobility, the same thing. So what we've got on top of all this is enormous move towards um, inegalitarianism in the United States. And the question I keep asking myself is, um, as I was writing this book, if you have this kind of change, what kind of effects does it have on the public? And they might, you can't go through this immense change in relative income and not have terrific changes in the general population and just the voting population. Bottom line, contemporary politics is divided the usual explanations I gave you, the elephant in the room, I believe, is race and immigration. That is intensified by minority, minor, uh, minority and also by the gender gap that has developed between the party and inequality. That the nation is changing in these fundamental ways, and the parties are identifying the two poles of the change. Uh, when you look at these uh, statistics, uh, the the Democrats explain, back up a second, the Democrats explain what's going on in party politics. They explain uh, Donald Trump by saying, well, it's the status anxiety of, of losing whiteness. And this, this story would fit in well with them. And indeed, a Democrat might tell the story that Trump is the last gasp of whiteness as we hurdle to majority minority there. Um, Republicans would, might tell a different story which is Trump heard the cry of dislocation that comes from this. He didn't actually look at the inequality data, but he felt the pain that comes from inequality. And I remember being in a TV studio on, um, um, on Super Tuesday, and what did Trump say? You're hurting because of the Japanese. Well, he had a di he, he put his finger on a problem. His diagnosis, you might think, is ridiculous, the Japanese, really. Um, but he, he felt this in some way. What did Hillary did say? We did it. We won but no diagnosis for this. So is that an explanation for Trump, or is it stat white status anxiety, or maybe it's both put together? I will say one last thing. I'm impressed again and again, before my conclusion, um, <laughs> I'm impressed again and again at the way we fiddle with the vote, the way we make vote hard in many places and so forth, and how that goes back to the first contested election. This is my favorite chart of all. This is the party that did not vote party. Who won the Electoral College, really? You, the blue ones are the ones Hillary won, the red ones are the ones Trump won, and the gray ones are the did not vote one. That is a majority in almost every state didn't bother to vote. Uh, so uh, if you want to change American <laughs> politics and don't want to wait for long-term, hard demographic changes, I think filling in that those blanks uh, is really the, the answer. All right, conclusions. Two things I've learned that I, um, that I haven't mentioned. One, change is really slow in American politics. The African-American vote came into the Democratic Party 
starting in 1936. You can actually see it starting in 32, and it didn't fulfill that till 1964, a long time. In this, at the same time, and because partially of that, the Republicans went from, uh, I'm sorry, the South went from pure Democrat to ruby red Republican, they started talking about it in 1938. If you read the editorials about the, the what you'd call the fire readers in 1938 starts, and it doesn't really end till 1990. That's a long time. You can see it coming. By the 1970s, it's clear it's coming, but it hasn't fully taken place. So we tend to read politics in two-year increments. And that, uh, I mean, we in the... Uh, Po popular, that's how it's read. And everybody thinks, oh wait, uh, we've got a demographic change. No, we don't, because Trump won. Um, no, you can't see it in two years. You've got to see it in decade changes. So if you really want to understand and make predictions about American politics, try to imagine how Georgia will vote 10 years from now, not, not in two, uh, 2020, but in 2030. You can really see it. It's the beauty of history. See it develop over time. The other is how constant changes. My golly, nothing is constant. California was red, red Republican. Um, but things just keep changing. Uh, the South becomes ruby red and is ruby red in 1990. And now, not so much, for heaven's sakes. Is Texas going to flip? Is Georgia going to flip? Virginia, you've got, is it still a purple state or are you finally a blue state? How about North Carolina? You, that, it's things that were unimaginable 20 years ago unless someone was really good at, uh, at predictions. So change is slow, but change is constant. Finally, I end the book with 13 do's and don'ts that come out of my analysis. I'll just try five on you. <laughs> one, and the biggest one, secure the goddamn vote. I'm, my golly, um, it's really hard to vote in the United States. It has been since 1800, and that does lots of mischief. And the main mischief it does is that, um, is that um, the most intense party people are the ones who vote, so you get lots of intense competition. Why does Chicago elect a mayor in February when it's cold on an off, off year? So no one votes. Even in this fantastic runoff they just had, what was the turnout? Was it a bit 30%? Um, so my suggestion is we need universal voting laws that simply say, uh, um, uh, Dingle, the congressman from uh, uh, Michigan, has a wonderful rant about this in his new book. When someone turns 18, we've got the technology, damn it, they're, they're ready to vote, just give them the vote. You know, uh, the idea of registering ahead of time, that came up in the 1840s when, the, the, as one of the Whigs said, if we can secure a good registry law, we will be safe for all time to come, safe from Democrats. Um, now, this sounds highly partisan. I, I, I know I'm on thin ice here, but if you were a, um, if you were a, um, a far-thinking Republican, you would think fighting against a wide franchise will help us in the short run. It really helps us in the two-year period. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Trump needs a small franchise, and it might help you in a, in a bit of a short run, but if it solidifies the current alignment if it takes all immigrants and pushes them to the Democratic Party, I mean, Asians had been safely Republicans for generations. When, um, when um, Kevin Phillips writes his famous book, The Emerging Republican Majority, um, he says, you know, it's great that we've gotten the vote for African Americans of the South because Southerners will not stay in the same party as as African Americans, so they will come to the Republicans. And if anybody calls us racist, then we're not racist. After all, we have the Asian vote in the Republican Party. Why did the Asian vote go to the Democrats? It went because, I believe, of Republican policy. There's a whole bunch of wonderful studies. Um, in one that came out of Stanford, uh, people came into the uh, room, and if they were Asian American, half the Asian Americans were told, oh, I'm sorry, this is only for Americans. Are you American? I can't tell. Uh, and they said, oh, never mind, go ahead, come on in. People who got that microaggression, when they were asked to list um, uh, different institutions and how much they liked them, they, they rated the Republican Party 12% lower, with no other cues. 
be having a microaggression about your ethnicity or about your race made you pissed off at Republicans. That can't be sustained in the long run. So even though my proposal sounds straight out of the Democratic Party playbook, I would say enlightened Republicans should be for it too. Second, I won't go into this because I've been talking long enough, but let me just say, unrig the rules. I mean, gerrymanders, counting the ballots. We, we're part, elections are still, put it this way, in the 1800s, we crushed the bosses in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, but we only did the job halfway. And we still let the parties run the elections. We've got to stop that. Third, I have a rant about embracing partisanship. I don't need to go into that there. If you think it's crazy, um, we can talk about it. But I think partisanship at the end of the day is actually a good thing. We've just set it up in a way that's become corrosive. We need to rethink our institutions in a way that contain partisanship. And we need to re-wonder, or at least reimagine our tribal conflict if Republicans really had to compete on a wide field, they would start going after the, the uh, um, people of color vote, as, for example, DeSantis did in Florida and got 40% of Latinos. It's why he won the election, not DeSantis, I'm sorry, um, uh, Scott in the Senate race. He won 40% of Latinos. It's doable, but for, uh, for Republicans, that's the great task. Not to hunker down in the white bunker, but to go after votes that, you, that you are, your policies are pushing you away. And the task for Democrats is to actually, and I have a whole rap about how this comes out of the 1930s, Democrats were long the populist party. They believed in the common man, but lost it sometime in the 1960s when arguing for social welfare became somehow, not somehow, arguing for racial minorities. Democrats need to see that inequality chart and make a set of policies that actually speak to our present condition rather than just counting up identities and saying in the long run we've got the right identities, we should win. Um, and that means civil like this and pandering to right to the end. Um, that means going back, going back to the um, to the original, I think, democratic vision from the starting in the 1890s, going right through the 1940s, the democratic vision that was lost through that period. I think it's the populist vision. Okay, let me stop there. Ah, I'm sorry for talking for so long. I'd like to turn it over to questions, but I'll go first. Oh dear. <laughs> so I have two, like uh -huh. a question and a comment. So. First is, if newspapers are the main source of information here, I'm a little surprised that it was sort of such a linear story toward partisan tribalism because, like, 1940s and 1980s was the golden age of journalism, right? Where the part where the newspapers themselves and the editors were specifically saying, we don't want to be partisan. Yeah. So even if there, so, so I guess the question is, what kinds of papers were you looking at and? How did you sort of systematically draw these conclusions? Because they seem to fly in the face of the trends in the news industry. Yeah. And then my other question is, um, I mean, like, it seems like you're sort of working from the premise that it would be good if everybody could hold hands and sing Kumbaya. But, you know, I look at this map, and I feel like, or oh. the, the red, the, the really bad. Um, <laughs> 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 you know, I look at these maps, and I feel like, well, the Democrats and the Republicans genuinely believe different things. I, as a Democrat, don't want to appeal to these Republicans. I don't want to um, move my positions in any way that could potentially woo some of them because I actually think they're fundamentally wrong on all of these issues. And I'm sure there are Republicans out there that don't feel like sitting at lunch with me. And so I guess I'm just wondering normatively like, why this is a, a problem if we can get rid of the racialized rhetoric and if we can sort of stop being so hate-filled, why are the policies themselves such that it wouldn't be okay to have partisan warfare just conducted in a more civil way? Absolutely. Um, so I totally agree with you. I don't think we have a problem. Uh, I, let me start with the second question because I think that's one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, Democrats and Republicans believe different things, yes. Uh, should they sit down and sing Kumbaya? Absolutely not. I think partisanship is a good thing. So there's a whole set of answers that, um, that say, well, let's find a way to bridge the partisan gap. Absolutely not. I oppose all of them. And so in that sense, I agree with you. And we'll probably get disagreement from other people uh, in this room. Um, but here's what my story tells. Starting with George Washington, we said, 
we don't like partisanship. And I believe to this day, a lot of political science literature on this, Americans are sort of uncomfortable about it. Now, I don't care if you're comfortable or not. We've never set up the institutions for intense partisanship. So if you have intense partisanship, fine, I'm all for it. But not if the intense partisanship leaks into the mechanics of voting uh, and the mechanics of our debates. So I'd like to distinguish two different things, really. One, elections. Um, have partisanship as, int as intense as you want, but you can't have a case where an election in 2000 gets decided by registrars who are picking votes up and saying two to one along party lines, this is a vote, this is not a vote, on pure party lines. If you have intense partisanship and you have robust institutions, no problem. But because our institutions weren't built for partisanship, partisanship in the vote count, in the mechanics of elections, is eroding the, the, the democracy itself. And it's worse. I think that is also true in the organization of Congress, um, in the organization of the courts, in the organization of all our institutions. They're built on the assumption of bipartisanship. The Senate doesn't operate without bipartisanship. I'm all for partisanship, but we have to rethink the institutions so the rules are clear. I, I think um, uh, 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 Pearson got this right when he calls it Calvin Ball. We don't have rules. We have Calvin Ball after Calvin and Hobbes. We just keep changing the rules. And what surprised me was that's been true all along. We've never set up the rules for partisanship. So that's my big take home. Uh, I didn't have time to go into it, um, but if partisanship, uh, I make a big plea at the end for no, let's go at it. But we have to go at it once the rules are clear. So I think we're in agreement on that. The journalistic story is very interesting. Um, I tell, I um, um, telescoped. What's the opposite? Microscope. Uh, so I told the story from 1830 to to. 1990, like in one breath. So let me let me play it out a little bit more. Um, the move of African Americans into the Democratic Party was really quite slow, um, and it took a couple of big bursts. But 1932 to 1948 was a pretty slow movement, and in that year, there's no doubt the journalists are very sober, boring, really. And the news media, you know, if you go down and watch, which I did, with some of the TV shows, you know, we've got the we've got the um, uh, the, the rule that says you've got to have uh, equality. You have Rush Limbaugh, you also have to have uh, Jen Laws. Um, so uh, the, um, the immigration story is even slower. You don't see much debate about immigration in the 70s uh, or even the 80s. It takes a while for that to develop. So the story of partisanship I'm telling, you see it beginning in Congress in the 70s and 80s, but quite slow. It really hits in the 90s. It hits in California with the proposition in 1994, and then uh, in the election, in the uh, Republican election in 1992 uh, uh, and 1996. That's when it really hits. And it's just at that moment that the media becomes really partisan. So this all really comes together in the Clinton era. And it's usually said, well, Clinton, and that was the 1960s. You know, the Clintonians, they were such 1960s. I think that's a superficial story. I think the 1990s are when this finally, this long trend really comes home. And of course, it's just when the Fairness Doctrine gets repealed, 1986, and the Reagan era, the technology permits this multiplication, and it's in the 1990s, just when we get this tribal difference, that we also get the explosion of the media. So you're absolutely right, and I've got to figure out a way to... Stop right there. Let me just say, I've got to figure out a way to present that in 45 minutes, but this is my first crack at it, so you've helped me out a lot. Maybe I'll skip the Hellfire talk next time. Yeah? Somewhat anticipating, but uh, this, this slow, dramatic change, but I want to go to the two decades prior to this, and to think through some of the changes that are taking place there, and maybe more clearly identify, well, why does this framework between immigration and race break down in the early 30s? And I mean, there's a few things that are on my mind. I, I'm thinking about Republican efforts in the 1920s to build a Republican Party in the South. I'm thinking about enterprising black Democrats 
including Du Bois, who endorses Wilson in 1912. Uh, and so like a series of failures for either party to accurately capture the black vote. And one of the things I wonder if it just boils down to is migration. Like we had, we had this huge exogenous shock to the system where not only does this framework hold in, in the kind of general partisanship between immigration and race, but it's also geographically separated. Like you could have that mm -hmm. framework work because blacks were in the South. And not voting. And not voting. And once they left, it now became a problem that you had to confront in the North. Like that's the, that's the catalyst, that's the critical juncture, that's the shock to the system. So I'm wondering, I know it's out there from, from research I, Sid and I have done in the black newspapers, if you found anything on how local partisans are responding, I guess this would be particularly interesting from um, Northeastern Democrats responding to the Great Migration. Absolutely. And then just so I can shut up and yes, hear you yes. talk some more. Absolutely. Um, you're absolutely right. Now, you know, I'm trying to get all this in 45 minutes, yeah. so I'm just giving you the big trend line. But if you look carefully, election by election, you're absolutely right. What's striking about... Um, so it, it's really... Um, the Republicans become... We, they get that race <coughs> is just not an issue for them. They don't need any black votes. And once 1890 comes and the black vote is suppressed, there's a, a quite remarkable story where um, there's an awful riot in Wilmington, North Carolina. The, Demo the Re Republicans have won in a fusion campaign with populists. And finally, they're just massacred. Um, and, um, and the Democrats take over in a, in a slaughter. Uh, we don't know how many people were killed, but um, there was ethnic cleansing. That is the about uh, a thousand of the community leaders, it's about 12,000 African Americans, are told you have to leave town. And they're all very explicit. Uh, the, uh, the next three weeks later, McKinley does a tour of the South. He never mentions that. Talks about how the North and South are together. And it's, we are one country after all. It's a shocking, um, you know, after, if you've got Wilmington in your mind, it's a shocking tour. But it's a telling tour. And what he's saying really is, we're, we now, um, we understand that the Democrats are in the South, but we're no longer going to fight you on race. Uh, the last great battle is the, is the Force Law of 1890, the Lodge Bill. Uh, now McKinley's trying to put that back. So even McKinley is spying the South as early as 1896. And I gave you the quote from Taft's inaugural address. This is the start of his inaugural address. And he's basically saying, look, we're done with race. So you can, you can actually, if you wanted to, you could start tracing it as far back as that. Go to 1877. Um, I wanted, I don't, well, we, let's stick let's, yeah, let's with one, uh, with one uh, that's the, uh, one thing at a time. The efforts of the African-American vote to go in the South, to make inroads in the South, people like Du Bois, don't work because African-Americans can't vote after 1908, depending on your state, between 1890 and 1908 thanks to the way they made the 15th Amendment, thanks to the nativists, uh, which, you know, again, uh, tied together. Um, and du Bois was very frustrated by this effort, as you well know. Um, but you're right, it's the great migration that breaks the lock. So the black vote starts uh, going north. There you can vote. The Democratic parties, often when they're in the minority, two different uh, things, sometimes <coughs> it's a minority group that sees this new vote um, and they think, if we can add this to our, our ethics, it's, and they begin to recruit them. The first one to do it is the printer gas machine in St. Louis. Sorry, Kansas City. Um, the printer gas machine is doing it in the 1920s. They actually have a black majority vote for Democrats long before on, but this is, this is a, a, a barely on the radar screen. You know, if you read the black newspapers, you see it, but it's very, it's, it's not on the radar. It's not in the national radar screen, but it's, <coughs> as always, local politics filters up, as always, except for now, all politics is national. Um, so you're absolutely right, it's the Great Migration. And I want to emphasize how seriously the Republicans took this on the local level. And again, Contra Katz Nelson, how jolting this was for the Democratic Party when people start coming in, like the people from St. Louis and Kansas City, particularly, sorry, Kansas City, and they start saying, no, we have to, we have to denounce lynching. 
Rose goes, I'm not going to denounce it. What are you, nuts? I'll lose the whole South. But in Kansas City, it's very important. So now you have local people actually saying, no, no, you have to do it. So it's the slow movement that comes only because of this exogenous shock of the Great Migration. And do you see, you see it in New York? Dewey is really worried. What is the most advanced civil rights act in the United States uh, in, 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 the, in the 1940s? Thomas Dewey's Civil Rights Act in New York. He negotiates and he signs it. Why? He needs that vote. He's losing it. So when Dewey runs in 44 against Roosevelt, there's no doubt who the more liberal candidate is on race. But his people tell him, no, you, you, you can make inroads in the South if you shut up about civil rights. It, it, many of the newspaper columnists, though it's been lost uh, to historians, I haven't seen this in any historical analysis, says, say that Dewey should have campaigned either one way or the other. Is he really going to win Southern votes than campaign in the South? But there's the Dixie, Dixiecrats in 48. So campaign for the Northern black vote, that's where you blew it. So yes, you're absolutely right. If you look at the fine texture analysis, I would say, I, I'm going to resist 1877, but we can talk about that afterwards. Um, I'd playfully throw it out there, because that's the new big argument with all the reconstruction revisionism, right? If the Republicans never pulled out troops, you wouldn't have had the exceptional South. You wouldn't have had this issue to begin with. It's just, yeah, there's so much more going on there. That I, uh, let's put that aside for now. I like the but, 1910s. The yes, yes, and I, I really love that it's an it's a old-fashioned machine politicians yeah. Uh, that are actually the ones p uh, pulling in the vote at first. Yeah. Hey, so first of all, I think we all appreciate the illustration of the devils, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. Um, Jim, the, so I really um, uh, am intrigued by this notion that the story of anti-big government is gets its political juice yeah. from racial fear. And so I just, but I need to hear more about that yeah. juicification. Like, how does it happen? It's not, it, it can't just be, you know, uh, uh, slaveholding states, right? I mean, because it continues. So, so what is that? What is that engine? Because I think it's doing a ton of work here. Yeah, it's doing a ton of work. And part of the answer is just to go uh, time by time and look at how, how the politics patterns. But I think, uh, and others, uh, historians have begun to pick this up. I'm thinking of Kevin Cruz in particular. Um, from early on, um, and by early on, I mean at least as early as the 1880s, the party of segregation, so this is not all the way back, learns that there's a way to create a national coalition, and screaming race doesn't do it. Screaming race really gets people uh, uneasy elsewhere. Now, locally, you scream race. That's how it's done. But if you try it on the national level, you lose. Um, and so what <coughs> people find, and they find this generation after generation, if you scream states' rights, personal liberty, you are part of a national coalition. It immediately gives you allies. Insofar as racism is celebrated as racism, Northerners and Westerners don't want to be part of it. So it's the coalition creating machinery that does it. So I want to emphasize that these are two completely separate trends in American politics. In none of my cases, though, are they separable. That um, people who want to keep current race relations usually repressive find that the only way they can build their coalition is by talking about personal liberty, and that's what they do. Um, it's just interesting, right back to the, um, to the 1800 election, you already see it. The state's argument is already quite strong. And, um, it's interesting the way it comes out after the election. Calendar reveals in 1802 that Jefferson has been sleeping with a slave, the very man that he paid to write stuff about Adams. Uh, he's through using State Department funds, by the way, talking about the media. Um, and it's interesting to watch how the press responds to this. In New England, there's outrage and delight. Um, they just hit the story again and again. Jefferson was carried into the Temple of Liberty on the, on the 
shoulders of slaves to the Electoral College, but also he's making more voters. Um, even John Quincy Adams writes a dirty limerick. Uh, and in the South, it's just, um, it's not a story told. Or in, the, in most of the country, it's not a story at all. It's not something we want to touch. Um, so race is not enough. It, it, it's just something. And coalitions, at least the short answer. Yeah. And, but that's good, and I'll have to put that into the talk. It's very helpful. This is great. So far, this yeah. is really helping. There's so much here, Jim. Yeah. So we'll have to talk linebackers. Yeah. But, uh, so I, I just, I just want to pick up quick before you do the newness. Um, <clears throat> just make one quick comment about Hank and I have been doing work arguing that neither party is a small number. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. Party begins, uh, the Republican Party begins in 2016, embracing things like the law and order. Uh, so if you can now, yeah, I argued that in Hellfire Nation, so I'm certainly sympathetic to it. Yeah, right. I mean, religion and the Christian life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that raises the stakes, right? Everything is up for grabs in a way that wasn't quite true when there's some difference between the parties. Yes. So now both parties really are committed. You could. To centralization. Yeah. In a way that. The it's uh, interesting the um, uh, because if you were to just focus on the 70s, um, part of what strikes me is it's not yet the party of big government that Phyllis Schlafly comes along and tries to stop, I mean, does stop the Equal Rights Amendment, arguing that you, know, you can't nationalize this. This, yeah. this has to remain a family issue. And um, and also argues, or and soon the argument is, you can't nationalize the abortion debate. You have to permit us to uh, forbid it. But really, starting with Wallace, and not, I haven't told the Wallace they're striking. I must say, as we were talking at breakfast, read the, the accounts of Wallace, and I know you guys have done this in 1964 in his campaign um, uh, appearances. My God, it's it's the same stuff, but he's the one who hit on Law, uh, on law and Order, uh, which Nixon picks up. And the newspapers mock him, saying, don't you know what Law and Order is a local issue? It has nothing to do with the national government. And he's saying, you know, I'm going to reimpose Law and Order, and that's the one that sends. And even in the 64 um, Republican convention, the Goldwater convention, Ike comes out there, you know, genial Ike. Um, <laughs> And he gives the speech, it's really quite a genial speech, but he departs a couple of times. And he says, and this is not in his text, but it is in the deliberate address, he says, and let's not be, and I don't have the quote right in front of me, but let's not do what some people do, become sympathetic to some predator who stabs someone with a knife and then throws himself at our mercy um, as a victim of racial oppression. Uh, he doesn't say racial oppression, victim of, uh, of prejudice. And the place goes nuts. And the African-American delegates there, like um, uh, Jackie Robinson, are, are just amazed at the power. It is coded racial reference, but it is a reference that we have to do something about, uh, about national, uh, national government. So that's a good wrinkle, and I need to think about that. So the party of government, this is certainly true what I've said but something begins to happen to the Republicans to, um, to nationalize law and order, which then the Democrats pick up, of course, in the 1990s. Let me think about that. It was a really good point. So I just um, wanted to ask you how your story um, is similar or different to Eric Schiffer's story, which we also Oh, yeah. yeah. So real liberalism transformed. I, I think looking at the 30s, Yeah. But what happened in the 30s? Yes. And I, and I take the uh, next point about migration. The demographics aren't rescued. So exactly. We have to look at the politics here. And Eric argued that there's this movement from the bottom up. The uh, civil rights movement, labor, and they form this fragile but, but, but pretty powerful alliance. I just wondered how, what's your, how your story is. You know, I'm trying to answer this in 30 seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm really late to launch. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I really agree. I think that's right. Um, 
and I think his emphasis on left labor, which is really worried about strike breakers. Yeah. So there, the communists are all about, we're not about race, it's about the working class, it doesn't matter about. It. The left labor unions that are communists are, well, we're only making a class of strike breakers, so they both go that way. Um, and, and there is that battle, and he's right. What I really like about that, and what absolutely is what I found, is um, that it comes up from the bottom. The National Party hates this. They, they don't want to have a racial debate within their ranks, and Roosevelt in particular doesn't want it. Um, and then by the 1940s, the Democratic Party really seems all in about, um, about, about, having, uh, about extending the, um, the labor board uh, what, what's it called? The Roosevelt's Labor Board, the Fair Labor, oh, Fair Labor Standards yeah. Committee, uh, Commission, um, and that they want to extend it. So they win that debate in labor as well, even more than in race. Uh, they want to extend it to the private sector, and the Republican Party has a choice: we go with our African Americans, who we've sort of lost, but the Northeast needs them, or we go with business, and that choice was easy for them. Fair play of practice. Yeah, yeah, they took me that long. Yeah, yeah, me too. I totally clocked. All right, I think maybe I've been talking too long if we can't uh, remember the MEPC. Um, but I think Schickles gets it basically right for that period. Uh, when I, you know, I don't think he's got the printer gas machine and all that. But I think his where Truman came from. Uh, where where Tr Truman came from? Yes, yes, uh, yeah, very much so. Yeah, I've been to the Truman Library with the eternal flame, mm -hmm. burning for liberalism, the last great liberal. Well, thank you all very much. Thank, oh, you, thank you, Jim. Great comments. Um, and everybody, please take like eight beverages. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>